Hi, my name is Joy Beckerman Maher and I'm an industrial hemp activist and entrepreneur. I've been involved in the industrial hemp movement for over 20 years. I'd like to talk a little bit today about industrial hemp and, and start with the history, why we find ourselves in the situation that we're in today where we are not able to grow industrial hemp, the world's most useful, most versatile plant. So first we'll start with how our country even uh, originated. It was industrial hemp that was able to give us our independence from England. Without industrial hemp, we would not have been able to gain this independence. We used this plant for the sails, the rope, the oakum between the uh, boards of our uh, ships to come over here. Um, we used it for our clothing, our paper, absolutely every, our bailing twine, everything that you can think of for a fiber or textile um, that we uh, needed to survive. It was used from industrial hemp at that time. In fact, our very first cannabis law in the United States, it was a uh, law to grow hemp, to make trial of the Indian hemp seed, which means to grow industrial hemp. And that law, uh, again in 1619, um, first took place in Jamestown, Virginia. There were even times of shortages such as between 1763 and 1767 in Jamestown where it was illegal for uh, farmers not to grow industrial hemp. We used it for our taxes, we used it as U.S. currency, and the reason why the government used the plant for U.S. currency and taxes of course was to encourage farmers and people to grow more. It was that useful and that necessary, critical and essential um, to our survival and for the thriving of, of our brand new nation. Moving up in time to the 1812, we discover that in fact great wars were fought over industrial hemp. In fact, the War of 1812 um, was a result of Napoleon's strategic um, infiltration and invasion of Russia for the specific purpose of cutting England's, England's supply of industrial hemp off. Russia was England's number one supplier of industrial hemp, which of course crippled their navy uh, and various other industries and uh, press and literature, everything being dependent on the industrial hemp plant at that time. Um, it also crippled our own supply as we too were depending on, um, not solely because we were growing it here, but also depending on the import of uh, industrial hemp industrial hemp from Russia. Moving on up in time now to 1850, we see that the U.S. Census shows 8,327 industrial hemp plantations across the United States and a plantation was defined as a 2,000 acre farm. So uh, at this point we realize in 1850 Truly, the industrial hemp uh, farming and agricultural industry here is booming, and it's booming because industry is booming and because our population is growing. Let's fast forward a minute to the 1930s. There was, to use the words of Ed Rosenthal, one of my favorite activists, a truly harmonic convergence of special interests that were taking place around this time in the country. The cotton gin was being developed, and there was a lot, there were fiber wars going on. Matter of fact, another tremendous scholar and activist in the industrial hemp movement, Dr. David West, has written a book called Fiber Wars that I strongly suggest anybody truly interested in what happened in the history here of industrial hemp reads. So you had a lot of southern senators who were being lobbied by cotton interests in the south as the cotton gin was being developed. Um, that was one industrial uh, invention that was happening. A couple of other major industries were moving in here with serious special interests and financial interests. And one of them was DuPont. DuPont had just obtained the patent for the synthetic polymer petroleum plastic making process. This was incredibly valuable to him. At the same time, William Randolph Hearst had obtained the patent for the sulfuric acid tree paper making process. Keeping in mind at the time that our paper was mostly made from hemp, um, and even today our finest Bible papers are made from hemp. In fact, the first version of the Declaration of Independence and the Gutenberg Bible and so on and so forth is paper made from hemp. We could go all the way down into the Vatican uh, sacred documents if we wanted. So he gets, he owns, Hearst owns a lot of timber up and down the East Coast, a lot of trees, and oddly also owns a lot of newspapers, emphasis on paper, which gives him an awful lot of power in terms of the media. So another 
interest that's coming in at this time. And now we're just going to quickly and just for a moment talk about the drug variety of cannabis is that the technology at the time in terms of being able to isolate various healing properties from the drug variety of cannabis, uh, the scientists were stymied. They could not figure out. There were already five pages of cannabis, drug variety of cannabis preparations in the U.S. Pharmacopoeia in 1927. They've since been completely eradicated from the U.S. Pharmacopoeia. Uh, we'll get them back in soon enough. But what was happening in the 1930s was they had figured out a way to isolate salicylic acid out of willow bark, which is how we make aspirin. So slowly but surely, the pharmaceutical companies then began to make patents on these pain relieving and analgesic type drugs using the technology and the science that was available to them. And again, they were limited with this co very complex medicinal plant, the drug variety of cannabis. So we have these major special interests coming in. Well, it just so happens that in 1937, Andrew Mellon was the Secretary of the Treasury. So Andrew Mellon had been the Secretary of the Treasury for multiple administrations. And he was also the head of several banks and the head of several oil companies. In fact, jumping back for a moment, Andrew Mellon had been the Secretary of the Treasury for so long that it's his signature on the 1914 bill, $10 bill, also known as the Federal Reserve Note, um, depicting a hemp harvest. So you can Google anything you want, the 1940, 1914 Federal Reserve Note, and there you will find our $10 bill signed by Andrew Mellon depicting the hemp harvest. Um, a side note is that the Federal Reserve, of course, is not actually owned by the Feds. It's a completely private bank. And look more into the Federal Reserve. Always follow the money. So, what ends up happening is that these special interests go to Andrew Mellon, whose nephew, as it were, is Henry Anslinger, the leader of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which is now known as the Drug Enforcement Agency. But at the time, it was the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and Henry Anslinger ran it, and his uncle Andrew Mellon was the Secretary of the Treasury, as well as the head of several banks and several oil companies. So here we have now the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. The 1937 Marijuana Tax Act, very interesting set of hearings. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to read the transcripts as I have of these three hearings that took place between July and December of 1937. They are absolutely fascinating, um, if not comical. Um, and even in fact that very first night, which it was kind of an emergency thing, a doctor from the American Medical Association shows up at these Senate hearings, Dr. Woodward, and he doesn't understand what is going on, why on earth these hearings are happening. The doctors are depending a lot on the drug variety of cannabis at the time, and he's there to represent the American Medical Association to stop this Marijuana Tax Act from happening. He is poo-pooed constantly throughout the entire set of hearings by Anslinger and his cronies. He also specifically, they on purpose continue to refer to cannabis, whether it be industrial hemp or whether it be the drug variety, as marijuana. And Dr. Bob Woodward constantly says, it is inappropriate for us to be referring to this medicine as marijuana. That's the street slang term. We should not be referring to cannabis as marijuana during these hearings. It is inappropriate to conduct ourselves in this manner and to refer to the medicine cannabis in this manner. And they completely ignore him. They have no respect for Dr. Bob Woodward. And in fact, by the third set of hearings in December, they're referring to the doctor who spoke in the first hearing and they're not even calling him by his correct name. It's a name that begins with W, but it's, it's not Dr. Woodward. It's quite fascinating and disturbing. Well, the Marijuana Tax Act passes, the farmers need a tax stamp from the United States government and the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and the industrial hemp uh, economy and farming industry is squashed in our country in 1937. But what do you think happens five years later? World War II? World War II happens, and the Navy needs hemp. We've always been using hemp. The Navy is number one relying on hemp during this time for sails, for parachutes, for backpacks, for the webbing in the backpacks and the webbing in the parachutes, for the uniforms, for the, the very uh, laces. 
uh, in the boots of these soldiers. Again, for the oakum, um, for everything, they need this cannabis hemp. But they've gone and destroyed the crop in America. So the United States Department of Agriculture makes a lovely film called Hemp for Victory. And you can YouTube it right now, Hemp for Victory. It'll be the most enlightening 13 and a half minutes you've had in a good long time. Please watch that movie. And they join with the 4-H clubs and they present this how to grow hemp five years after they've made it illegal. And they take 400,000 pounds of industrial hemp seeds. They distribute them from, in, to farmers from Kentucky to Wisconsin. And between 1942 and 1946, these farmers grow 42,000 tons of industrial hemp for the war effort during all of that time. As soon as the war ends, that's over, and our last grow in this country before the more recent modern-day industrial hemp grow research project in Hawaii, which I'll tell you about in a second, was in 1958 in Wisconsin. Let's fast forward a little bit from 1958 to 1970, and we get the Controlled Substances Act. The Controlled Substances Act now starts to make schedules of drugs and controlled substances and they decide that marijuana is going to be part of this Controlled Substances Act and they define marijuana as including industrial hemp. And in fact, this is 2013 as I make this uh, video and we have the Industrial Hemp Farming Act of 2013 that seeks to remove the words industrial hemp from the definition of the word marijuana within the Controlled Substances Act. So let's take a moment to talk about the differences between the oil, seed, and fiber variety of cannabis and the drug variety of cannabis. Industrial hemp and the street term what is known as marijuana and medical marijuana uh, are of the same genus and species. They are both of the same genus cannabis and the same species sativa. Where they are different is after that part. They're different varieties. They're different, in fact, cultivars entirely. For example, hemp is grown for its seeds and its stock, very tall, about four inches apart, so as to choke out all of the weeds. Marijuana is grown for its bushy flowers and medicine-filled buds, about four feet apart, again, grown for its bush, its leaves, its flowers. They are completely different. The marijuana plant, or the drug variety of cannabis, has a high THC, generally lower CBD, cannabidiol amount, whereas the industrial hemp plant has a high CBD and a low THC amount. In fact, industrial hemp generally has less than 0.3% THC in it, and there's no uh, medicinal value as far as THC goes in the industrial hemp plant. Tremendous nutritional value, which we'll talk about in a moment, but no real medicinal value as far as the psychoactive uh, med medicine THC. And now let's discuss the hemp seed, yet the third part of the plant. So the hemp seed has the most digestible form of protein of any plant, of any meat, egg, soy, or other high protein food on the planet. And this is because the hemp seed has 20 of the 22 amino acids required for us to basically um, manufacture our food into protein to build into muscles and cells. It also has the highest profile of essential fatty acids of any seed or nut on the planet. Essential fatty acids are such that they're they are properties that our bodies need in order to make other processes happen, like for our brains to transmit, inter, uh, to transmit information between our synapses, and in fact for our cells to be able to develop and grow. And they are essential because our body doesn't make them by themselves, so we have to get them from other sources. Well, hemp seeds, again, has the highest profile of essential fatty acids of any seed or not on the planet. So you can actually completely replace your omega or your, your um, fish oil supplement with three tablespoons of shelled hemp seeds per day. And you'd also get 10 grams of the, of the most digestible form of protein that you can. Hemp seed oil, we get everything of course from our cosmetics which Cannabis Basics uses, the fertile hemp seed oil for all of, um, uh, all of the Cannabis Basics uh, lotions and remedies and preparations. And we also can use hemp seed oil for a nutritional supplement, uh, taken literally orally 
Um, and But it's processed differently. Human consumption hemp seed oil is processed differently than industrial hemp seed oil, which is used for the cosmetics and can also be used for fuel. Um, hemp seed oil has so many applications, again with the paints and the varnishes and sealers. Um, it is an amazing plant. We use all parts of it, the woody inner core, the outer bast fibers, and the seeds. Reintroducing the crop of industrial hemp to United States farmers and to United States economy is a no-brainer. It's a win-win for everybody. It will create jobs, it will revitalize our farming economy, and it will bring industry back here to the United States where it belongs. It's a superior sustainable crop. It requires almost no pesticides at all. It chokes out its own weeds by virtue of the closeness of how it grows together and the fact that it grows so tall. It's an excellent rotational crop. It grows a fully ready to harvest between 70 and 120 days depending on the climate and depending upon the strain. Um, it produces tons more paper per acre than trees and trees can take hundreds of years to fully develop. Whereas this renewable, amazing renewable resource can take between 70 to 120 days to fully grow. It's a no-brainer. It's the longest, strongest, most durable natural soft fiber that we have on the planet. It is mold resistant, pest resistant, rot resistant, UV resistant. Used as a building material, the woody inner core of that stem is used as a building material for hempcrete um, and various other applications. Uh, the outer bast fibers, which of course are what we use for the, our um, cloth and rope, uh, that again are UV resistant, mold resistant, and pest resistant. Those are also used for building materials, various forms of insulation. Let's re-energize the farming industry in the United States. Let's build our economy, create jobs, buy American hemp, be with a sustainable crop, save the planet. Industrial hemp in the United States is our history and it's our future.